Good evening, Global Forum. Nice to see you all. Um, thank you all for being here today with us for this really important conversation. We have an incredibly distinguished group of guests representing different parts of the world, and we have very little time together, so we're going to really dive in. Um, I'd like to frame the conversation this way. We could spend our time telling horror stories about anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism in our respective parts of the world, and these are stories that must be told. However, in the time we have today, I'd like us to endeavor to understand where we go from here. So each of you represents a different part of the world, and whether it's Canada or Europe or Latin America, South Africa, or even, dare I say, the United States, some members of the Jewish community are asking shocking questions. Do I belong here? Is there a Jewish future for me and my kids here? And if so, what will that Jewish future look like? So let's begin. Anthony, I'd like to start with you. You're a legislator in Canada. You've been very outspoken uh, against your government and your own party's approach to the Israel-Gaza war. And it has been your message to your colleagues in the House of Commons. Um, you've been quite vocal about this, but what has been your message and what legislative tools are you using or do you believe we can use to pursue um, some outcomes that will be more favorable for the Jewish community? So it's been very shocking. Um, I come from a party in the center left, and Canada, like the United States, is one of the very few countries that has a bipartisan consensus or has had a bipartisan consensus on Israel, where the center left party, our liberal party, is as pro-Israel as our conservative party on the center right. And that has been the case in the eight years that I've sat in the House, and it sort of fell apart over the last five or six months as I watched many of my colleagues who previously had been very supportive of my stands on Israel suddenly disappear. And I've faced motions and resolutions in the House that I've had to vote against from my own party, um, and it's been deeply disappointing. Um, but what I've tried to do is, again, emulate what we've done in Congress. So, Number one, I convened hearings at the Justice Committee, which is our version of the Judiciary Committee, on anti-Semitism, focusing on college campuses. I had colleagues uh, from my side that joined me in sending a letter to all the biggest presidents of universities in Canada. We confronted the presidents and called them out on not adopting IRA, on not including Jews in diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, on not enforcing their codes of conduct to allow encampments on their schools. Um, and what I've tried to do as legislative tools, in addition to the recommendations that they adopt IRA, they include Jews in DEI, DEI programs, that they make sure that they apply their codes of conduct. Um, we also, at a federal level, as opposed to in the US where it's at the state level, control the criminal code. So I've been proposing bubble legislation, which would mean that you can no longer block entrance or exits to places of worship schools or community centers that has happened in Canada through demonstrators chanting offensive chants. I propose to have a government-wide strategy on IRA, which we have adopted as a Canadian government, to have a handbook on IRA that we will send out to provinces, municipalities, and universities telling them how to implement IRA. Um, and of course, trying to work with police across the country to have the attorneys general at the federal level and at the state level, and in our case provinces, um, tell everybody exactly how they're supposed to apply the criminal code and make sure that they're actually enforcing it against people that are crossing the line. So I think there's a lot of legislative tools we can add to them, um, but what I, I ended up resolving myself is that because even though I'm frustrated about Israel, you know, I, I, I I am still who I am, I'm still a liberal at heart, and I've got to push my party back to the right place on the issue that I don't agree with them on, as opposed to just forgetting that I agree with them on a lot of other issues, and that's what I've been trying to do. Ariella, in December, AJC convened more than 100 Ibero-American and US Jewish leaders in Chile where they unanimously endorsed AJC's Santiago Declaration, reaffirming regional commitment to fighting anti-Semitism, to standing by Israel in the war against Hamas, supporting democratic values and human rights worldwide, and promoting continued collaboration. 
How do these hemispheric partnerships help strengthen your efforts, especially in a country like Chile, which has adopted such an overtly hostile posture toward Israel? Well, first, thank you very much for having me here, and I have the opportunity to talk to you about this and what is happening, and also for AGC to have been in Chile for that opportunity uh, when we signed uh, that document. It is certainly very important that we all work together on this, and I think we can all agree that uh, this is a moment in which we are really one Am Israel and Kol Israel Arabim de la Zeh. So it's uh, more important now than ever to be together. And uh, in the neighborhood, it's not easy. You can see what is happening in Colombia with uh, Petro. You can see what is happening with AMLO in Mexico. And uh, we see Brazil and Nicaragua and Bolivia and also Chile. Uh, so we have to work together uh, to fight these uh, ideologies that are really uh, putting in danger all what we have uh, achieved in so many years, uh, not only for, for the Jewish people, but for everybody, for democracy. So it's very important to work together. And in the case of Chile, in which we have a president that is uh, clearly and openly against Israel, and he hasn't met, for example, with the Jewish community since uh, he came to the office. Um, it, for us, uh, United States, for example, it's very important uh, as a country. So if we have the support of uh, United States or the American Jewish Committee or other countries, uh, it makes us uh, to feel more you know, capable of uh, talking to the government and talking to other people and to make, we have a very particular situation in Chile and I don't know if everybody knows, but we have the largest Palestinian community uh, outside of the Middle East. So we also have, we don't have only problems with the government, but we have problems with the civil society. And um, from that point of view, having the civil society seeing that we are not alone and even if they are a lot because there are many people there that uh, are supporting not only because they are Palestinian, but also because they are uh, with the cause. Uh, it's very important to see that we are not alone, that we are together, and even a picture of this beautiful audience is incredible for us and help us to fight uh, in these difficult moments. Great. So speaking of countries taking a hostile posture toward Israel, uh, Karen, South Africa has led the effort to bring Israel before the International Court of Justice on charges of genocide, which has created an incredibly challenging climate for the Jewish community of South Africa. The, the viciously anti-Israel African National Congress has showed that it, may, it faced a little bit of a decline in the recent elections. It lost some support, it lost its majority. So can you help us interpret these results? And does it signal a possible shift in attitudes towards Israel or was it driven by other factors? Sure, thank you very much. Firstly, thank you for having me here. And they say since October the 7th, the Jewish heart beats in unison and I certainly feel it over here. So thank you very much. Thank you. But if the Jewish heart broke globally on October the 7th, the South African Jewish heart broke again on the 29th of December when, as you said, our government took Israel to the ICJ. The little sliver of hope that we have in our community has been fighting our government tirelessly since then has been the elections that we knew were coming and that we knew would signify a drop in the uh, percentage of vote that the ruling party, the Liberation Party, the ANC, had. What's been really interesting is that the ANC fought this election very much on a foreign policy, Israel-Palestine uh, platform. Lots, all of the uh, platforms before the elections were run with them in Palestinian scarves or kafirs. And the very, very last thing that our president said in the very last election rally to the country that is suffering from a lack of electricity, water, etc., the very last thing he said was the cry from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free before the elections. So fortunately, the good news, there is some good news of that. Although there had been, uh, it had been in intended that, it was, sorry, we knew that they would drop, they dropped significantly more than anybody had expected to just under 40%. <laughs> Thank you. 
And I know there's some South Africans in the audience, so they'll understand this. They got what we, this is the good news, they got what we call in South Africa a snot clap, which means they got a smack that the... S <laughs> I'll leave the rest to your imagination. Take yeah. So that's the good news. The politicking that was partly, partly not entirely, but partly a distraction, really achieved very little in terms of gaining them votes, in particular the Muslim community, which I think that they had expected to come out for them, did not come out for them. That's the good news. The less good news is they remain, at just under 40%, the biggest proportion of votes in the country. They will continue to hold significant power in the country, and it's unlikely, I think, that the major positions, including foreign affairs, will shift completely. We will, and hopefully with your help, we do have a brief time, I think, and a bit of an opportunity here to continue fighting. It's really clear that this foreign policy won them no votes. There's no support, really, for the levels of anti-Semitism the way we're seeing around the world. We're not seeing them in South Africa, oddly enough. The hostility is all from our government. It's not coming from the street. And I believe that with your help, we will continue to fight from the southernmost tip of Africa, the only voice in the African continent against the government's position. We'll continue to fight it. And I think that we, at, with some extent, we can perhaps push it back a little bit. Unfortunately, I can't say that there'll be a massive shift in the foreign policy, but we can say that what they did try to achieve was not achieved in terms of the domestic um, support that they were hoping to get. Thank you. We will take good news in whatever way we can find it. So. <laughs> Um, Emma, I'd like to ask you, all eyes have been on students, and certainly here in the U.S., but also around the world. And we've seen Jewish students, and so many of you are here, so thank you, Jewish students, all of you who are here with us today. We've seen all of you, many of you, all of you here at least, uh, standing firm and proud in your Zionism and Jewish identity, and we've seen examples of such extraordinary courage and resilience in the faces of unspeakable circumstances. So for this room of several thousand Jewish leaders and allies, and for all of those who are watching on the live stream, what is it that Jewish students need from all of us to help turn the tide? Thank you very much for receiving me. Um, I will start by saying that 7th of October try to destroy our generation. They really try to scare us. But what we've seen on campuses and in the society in general is that it failed. It failed because on campus we saw the resilience of our Jewish students. We saw that they did not give up. And they will not give up. We saw that they were proud Jews on campuses. They did not start hiding. Um, even though it was very complicated, we saw it. Um, so you already did it, but I really want to give another round of applause for all the Jewish student leaders that are at the forefront on campuses. Um, here in this room. And I highly encourage you to look on your left and on your right. You will for sure find a student, whether it's a student from Greece, a student from uh, the UK, a student from Argentina. Uh, I really encourage you to discuss with them. Um, they have a lot to, to talk about. Um, this is the moment to also ask them personally what they need. Um, I will give you some example. I think that what we need from you at the moment is first, you to trust us, to trust the youth. We know what we're doing. Um, I assure you we know what we're doing. <laughs> Trust and to listen, because it's different, to listen to us as well. Um, I think, you know, in the term of support, uh, there are so many different ways to support us. Just a couple of examples. If you have a law firm, you can also help us having legal advice when it comes to maybe suing universities or other forms of, uh, or other forms of legal advice. Um, if you're a, psycholo a psychologist, um, you can also help us with providing your, your help and your availability for our students. Um, if 
you uh, have political contacts, as Anthony also said, uh, to help to push for IRA definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism on campuses, we need them. Uh, your student representative, the unions of students in their countries, they need the support of the community and anyone else that can also support. And lastly, if you don't have a law firm, if uh, you're not a psychologist, if you don't have the political um, capacity, you can also help financially. Um, I think I have to say it because it's very important to understand that for some of our unions, and especially in Europe, we've seen lately that they were facing a choice. The choice was uh, for some to um, decide whether to host a Shabbat dinner or uh, to invest a budget in printing a poster for the hostages. And I don't think that should be a choice for the student union. They should be able to, at the same time, foster their Jewish life and uh, be proud in their political activism. So these are some ways for you to, to help and to support us. Thank you. I think you came here with a fan club, but it just yeah. grew exponentially, which is very exciting. Uh, in, our, in our final moments, we don't have a lot of time, so I'd like to zoom out a little bit and look at the bigger picture. Is this tidal wave of anti-Semitism, this anti-Israel mob mentality that we see, this propaganda war on Israel and on Jews, is this a harbinger of more to come? Is this an all-out assault on the ideals of liberal democracy? And if so, what do we do? So, you know, that's a simple one. Anthony, I'll start with you. <laughs> wow, what an easy question. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I can only speak from the Canadian perspective and the American perspective because these are the two countries that I can pretend to understand. I believe that the vast majority of Canadians and Americans are with us. They abhor the anti-Semitism. They support Israel. This is a small, loud, angry group that is holding our country hostage, that is yelling nasty, hateful things at college campuses and on streets, but they don't represent the majority of our populations. We live in the two countries in the world that not only are the golden of Medina, as our ancestors would have called it, they've given our people opportunities that no other country in the world has ever given. And we, as a community, have done more for these countries in proportion to our numbers than anyone else. And so if you ask me the first question, is there a vibrant future for the Jewish community in North America? Absolutely there is. This is our home, and we will ensure that our countries continue to have the legacy of the Jewish community, not only today, but a thousand years from now. Emma, do you think that your generation understands what is at stake? I think that my generation actually more than understand and actually live it every day. Um, as I said, they are on the ground. They are the ones um, that are being called fascist Zionists the minute that they want to stand for Israel or just to fight against um, stereotypes, anti-Semitic and stereotypes every, and everything. Um, so I think we are more than aware. And at the moment, also I would like to mention that today for Europe, uh, it's a important day since uh, we just had the results of the European Union elections. Um, I have to be honest with you, I think for our generation, it's one of the darkest day uh, for Europe when it comes to this rise of uh, political extremism. And we, the youth, we are aware of this and we will continue to fight against political extremism and the rise of populism everywhere. Um, we need this fight. Uh, I mean, you all know that fighting against anti-Semitism and hatred is not the fight of the Jews, uh, but is the fight of each and every single one of us um, and the society in general. So we will continue to, to build uh, alliances with non-Jewish organization, uh, with other minorities. Um, it, is, it is tough. I'm never going to say the contrary, but it is very much needed. So we are aware and we will continue to fight. And Ariella, do you think that uh, people in Chile at some point, non-Jews in Chile, will start to sort of wake up and realize that 
what is happening is not good for them either, that it really requires, as Emma said, all of society to respond. And what, do you, what more can it do, what can we do, and what more will it take for people to realize that? Well, I think that uh, there are many people in Chile and in the world that realize it, but there are many people that haven't. Uh, and that's something that has to make us really aware that we have to work together. So first of all, I think we certainly have to um, try to gather, gather our resources uh, to work together in communications uh, and also in people that are not Jews and they can speak up uh, for us because that's very important. Um, but I think that uh, we see Israelis, uh, they are fighting in Gaza, in Israel, and we need to fight in social media, and everybody has to fight in social media and in the press. Every one of us has to be a soldier of Israel in social media and with this propaganda, and we have to work together. We have to manage to work everybody together to fight this terrible propaganda that we have seen in the last months. Absolutely. Thank you. And Karen, what about allies? Uh, how can we involve more sectors of society in, in finding solutions? So I think from South African point of view, we really are quite fortunate, despite the very negative position of our government, we had what we called a Seda plate at one stage, which was suddenly put out by BDS, which spoke about which parties to vote for that were into Israel and which parties not to vote for that were pro-Israel, and they're all neutral. And there were quite a number of parties that are in fact either pro-Israel or neutral. So that's one ally that we look at. And certainly the Christian community, South Africa is a deeply, deeply religious country. Um, they have a tremendous respect for the Bible, for the Old Testament, and we have many allies there, um, and we are working with them. And I think that for us as a community, and I think globally, it's important not to feel the whole time that we are alone, because we're not. We have allies, we have friends, we must work with our friends, and I really do rely, there's an African expression which is called Ubuntu, which means I am only a person because you are a person. And I think that that's really a, a strong message against hate, is recognizing the personhood within all of us. Beautiful. We have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to ask you all, what gives you hope? You just gave us a little bit of an answer. Anthony, what is giving you hope in these moments? What is giving me hope is that people understand, more and more people understanding that anti-Semitism is not a Jewish issue, right? That the biggest tropes about Jews, that Jews control the world, is a threat to our democracy and a threat to our constitutional order. Because if you believe that, why have fair and free elections? Why believe in the results of an election? They, they, they understand that it's a national security issue, that it's not our friends down the street that are writing these horrible anti-Semitic posts. They're coming from Iran, they're coming from Russia. And the more that people understand that, the more allies we are having. And I really believe that people across this political spectrum are starting to see that anti-Semitism is both a national security issue and a democratic issue. And I think we're getting a lot more allies coming. Yeah. Ariella, what, what gives you hope in these moments? She gives me hope. I was, yeah, I was saving you for of last course. time for that reason. <laughs> now, our young people, they, they have been incredible. They have no fear. They, they want to be Jewish and get out and uh, their identity and everything. So, of course, we, we are a great uh, people. And Israel is incredible. And, uh, and they are incredible, so we are fine. Yeah, we have done. I mean, it's amazing. Emma, what gives you hope? Well, this is my answer as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just like seeing this resilience of, of Jewish students and, and their, you know, their strength. They are so strong. We don't see it first, like, talk to them. Talk to them and you'll see how strong they are, how passionate they are. All of them are volunteers. They are not doing that. This is not their job. So that we're clear, this is not their job. They have studies. Some of them are also young professionals, and they are doing it out of passion for their people, for the Jewish people. And uh, I'm proud of all of you, so continue. <laughs> well, I think you've all given us hope. Whoops. You've given us hope. Um, you're giving us marching orders also. You've given us inspiration. We are inspired by your leadership, by your courage, by your voices, by your vision. 
uh, and we continue to work together as one Jewish people in, in service of Am Yisrael Chai, uh, and to help ensure the future of the Jewish people is strong and resilient. So I want to thank all of you for being with us today, and thank all of you. Thank you.